Hi, welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking. This is Deanna. Um, I hope you don't mind the white noise of the fan in the background, but I'm afraid I'm going to expire if I don't have it on. And I have a great video idea today, and I hope that you're with me on this. It's a design uh, episode here. And what I'd love to do is talk about primitive rugs and primitive rug design. And since I already know that you are or are interested in being a rug hooker or a punch needler, um, I know that you're creative already, and I know that you can do this, design your own primitive rug or hooked design. Um, so I'm gonna show you what my process is because I think it's really easy and something that everybody can do. And I think we get overwhelmed sometimes with the idea of doing something original, but um, also inspired by it if there's a special pet or a special memory or um, a special flower or plant or something. Your house, your own house makes a great primitive design. But I'm gonna show you how to sort of cheat a primitive design by doing it in halves or in quarters or in uh, repeats. And these are all gonna be very recognizable types of motifs for a primitive design. And um, I, I'm just gonna walk you through doing it on your own with very few materials so you have something original that you can play with. And then I'm gonna show you a couple primitive rugs that I'm working on right now from designs I did about a week ago. So let me start, I'm just, uh, we're gonna walk through everything here. Let me start by showing you um, the way I normally work on designs, right? Very, very small. Um, this is my process, this is called uh, it's 1230 in bed, why are the children still awake, I'm going to kill myself type of mindset. Uh, these are Halloween pictures which go well with that, but I usually work really small in this way. I'm not going to do that today so you can see what I'm doing, but my point is that this size is great. In bed is great. In the margins of your diary, great. This all works. This is some primitive designs I was trying to think out uh, for act actually latch hook rugs, so very, very simple. Uh, gravestones and pumpkins with wings and stuff. I'm doing a lot of Halloween stuff right now. So these are some of the larger designs that I just finished and I hope that you can see them. I have some of them in different forms here. This is Mr. Jack. Um, somebody just bought him. A couple people just bought him. Most of the designs that I do that are primitive, I'm going to put this behind so you can see better. Um, my trick is to fold it in half and then draw it. So everything I'm showing you right now, just quickly before we get into it, is something that I have folded in half and just drawn. So with Mr. Jack, folded a piece of paper in half, drew half a pumpkin face, half a smile, one eye, half a top hat, half a bow tie, half a torso, and then I added these so that they would be exactly the same on both sides, and then I flipped it over, traced it, and I had a complete design. And primitive, the epitome of primitive. Primitive, by definition, means you, you are absolutely paying no regard to perspective, proportion, color, you want a um, blue sun and a yellow whatever, dog wheelbarrow, actually those things could be yellow. Not very creative right now in my head, but um, you can use any sort of color and imagination you want with primitive rugs, and the more the better. So something like that worked for that. This is a much larger design I did. It was It's like a sort of a tattoo design. I am by no means a tattoo person. Uh, I have one secret one that I got about 30 years ago, but who knew they would be so popular then? Nobody can ever see it either. But um, this is another design that was half. It, it's like a steampunk type girl, um, but it's exactly the same on both sides except trick and treat are reversed. And I'm using in my motifs a lot of times the year and giving people blocks because some people like to add their initials or a pair of initials. But again, this is a design that I drew half of. Half a face, one wing, half a cameo, half a bar, one, you know, uh, one earring. This is another one that I worked like that. This is a design I've used quite a few times and I've got working right now. Um, I'll show you this one at the end, actually. I've been working on this one like crazy. This is a very sort of folky design I did. You can see I folded it on half on this piece of paper, did one girl, one guitar, one leaf, the bird, the dog, the owl, flipped it over, traced it, and then I've got a double. And it makes a remarkably good primitive design to double up like this. These are some others that I just did this past week, uh, Halloween ones that are just coming out now. Um, a cauldron, this is like um, crazy colors and smells bubbling out of the cauldron. I'll probably add some bubbles. But as you can see, it's perfectly symmetrical in the sides. I've got two borders. We're gonna get into that in a second. That's gonna be one of the hallmarks of primitive design is the way that you frame it up. So that's my cauldron. This is the pair of witch's boots. Again, folded in half. It's identical on both sides, right down to the spiders flying out of the sides. One boot 
fold it in half, um, half a star, half a cobweb, one on each side, trace, and voila. Same thing with Pussy Willow Will. He's folded in half. He's got identical Pussy Willows on both sides, a swag on the top. This is another very easy trickster motif. You can do so much with a swag. I just did it with the topiary design that just came out. I also did it in the July kit, the patriotic kit with the elephant and the um, donkey. And the, even this is a half design. This is Haunted Hill, a halfway design. Right down the middle, I actually drew the hill. I drew two ha little haunted houses and a connecting road. And then I started draw drawing stylized trees and I drew a few stylized trees on the face. And then I realized when I opened it up that when I, when I figured out the trees a little bit better because they weren't exactly like this, eyes, nose, and I put, added the mouth. But when I opened it up, I saw the possibility of turning the hill into a pumpkin rather than a hill and putting the trees in a strategic way to have the face. But I didn't know that and I didn't notice that until I opened it back up. So all kinds of magic can happen when you do that. So those are halfway designs. I'm gonna show you how to do those first. Let's do that first. And then I'm gonna look at two other styles of design. One other style, the repeat design. So all I use when I'm working on a design is a Sharpie. It doesn't have to be the um, industrial ones, the permanent ones. Sometimes I use these things. I don't know if you can tell, but this is a uh, paper with a very, very large grid. And this is a paper with a medium grid. And this is a paper with a really small grid. So sometimes I will slip them behind my tracing paper just to give me definition uh, with what I'm doing. I'll show you an example of that. Sometimes if you don't have tracing paper, you can just do this if you just want to get a measure under your piece. So let's start by looking at a way to start a primitive design. I'm just going to use a piece of, tra a piece of tracing paper. Now, with my designing, that was in um, sarcastic quotes, I usually work like this, right? But today I'm going to work like a normal person to show you how to do this right. So I'm going to take out rulers. That's something I don't normally do. Um, just to get a fairly straight line. You know what? I'm not. I'm not going to do it. These are rulers. I bet you have some and you're probably better than me at using them. So you'll get a better design if you do. But I still work like this, right? And I can square it out later. I'll tell you how you can finish it and get it onto your thing later. So let's just start here. Um, let me put a piece of paper behind it. So when you're starting a primitive design and you're just fooling around and you're waiting to be inspired, the best thing that you can do for yourself first is frame it out. Now, the most common way to frame out a primitive design is with a side border, a big bar border. So occasionally you see the bottom border. The problem with having a heavy bottom border is people are half expecting to see a word. If you want to put a word, then you want the bottom border. I'm going to do both. Let's start with this kind of border. Now, I roughly have it behind my um, grid. So I'm just going to stick with the grid behind my paper and square it out. I'm going to flip it over, square it out here too. Doesn't look exactly square, but I got to be me. So I know I'm sort of the same on both sides at this moment, sort of. So what will I do next? I do want some kind of bottom definition. I often do. So I'm going to add this. Flip it over and add it again. And I'm going to think about that later because what I can do later if I want to is continue it here. Let's do that now just for an example, right? I'm going to continue it here and then do something like this. Box it out, log cabin style or whatever you want. Box it out or do something like 2020, right? And now if I did it there, I have to do it here too. So I'm going to box it out here too. And maybe on this side instead of 2020, I want my initials. D, D. So I'm well on the way going to go back to the principle of this thing and I'm going to decide what do I want in the middle you know I have a lot of Halloween stuff going on do I want a pumpkin type design in the middle let's let's go for that a pumpkin's always easy so I'm going to start with a pumpkin type design bring them right down bring them around the other side give them a stump mirror the stump now just going to decide personal things like what kind of eyes do I like best? I like these kinds of eyes the best for a pumpkin. Triangle ones are great too. Ones that look like they have stitches like Nightmare, Nightmare Before Christmas also good. Um, I like mouths like this. I was just talking about Nightmare Before Christmas. I like that. 
a stitch's mouth. It's kind of scary. Um, and then I can choose a nose. I like a big triangle nose like that. Kind of like a scarecrow type nose. So, so far I got the pumpkin. Now I'm going to give him some design lines just to make it look more real to me. Give him some little ridges. Give him some ridges on this side too. This is a primitive design, right? I can't make a mistake and neither can you. So, so far let's just cheat. Pumpkins in the middle there. So what I can do now is think about my borders. What people love to do on primitive borders are, for example, plants and trees. So you could run a squiggle up like this and say it's coming down. What could we do on the bottom of it? Do an apple, a pumpkin, a bell. Um, you could just do a design, like a circle with this kind of flower in it. Who cares, right? It's just, it's just for fun. I'm gonna do a bigger one. Doing different sizes is great. You know, I did a video on um, Waldeboro rugs yesterday reviewing a book, and one of the principles of the Waldeboro rug was that it was not identical from side to side. The, one of the principles of a um, primitive is it usually is, but it's not a rule. There are no rules. There are no rules. So it's important to know that, but I will have it in the back of my mind that I do have the choice do I want to make it an exact match? Do I want to do a slight color change from one side to the next? Do I want to do a slight size change from one size to the next? Do I want to make one of these circle flowers I'm drawing, wagon wheel flowers, uh, gigantic, just to shake things up? Who knows? So far, this is what I've got. You can see it's already coming along. It's recognizable as a primitive design. To speed things up, let's fool with this, right? I'm gonna add some stripes. Adding stripes in the bottom border is always a good thing. I'm going to add another row of stripes. And let's say in the middle stripe, I do like little, a little brick thing, a little checker thing. Could make those black and white checkerboard type designs. I'm going to come over here, mirror the thing. Because now I've gotten a border. And in my mind already, I'm thinking about colors. I'm thinking about whether I want an orange pumpkin, a white pumpkin, a blue pumpkin. I'm thinking about having all of these possibilities and these colored bars that I could do stuff with. I could make them patterned. I could checker them. Um, I could do all kinds of stuff. There's probably going to be more than four because this is really wide. But at least I know that in that little sort of quadrant, I am expecting to put colorful stripes. So back to the pumpkin. Now, another good thing about primitive design is you can often break your border. So why not, right? Let's come over here with one of our giant flowers. Now I gave this big wagon wheel flower a much larger size. And since we're going spooky, why don't we give them spooky, spiky petals? Now this is a video and we are doing a design together. If you are doing the exact same design that I'm doing and you are following along, this is now your design. Do not worry about copyright. Do not worry about who it belongs to. If you are doing this design with me right now, this design, not the ones I've already printed and selling as patterns, but if you're working with me right now doing designs, these are yours. So just know you can do whatever you want with them. These are your designs. This is a how-to. Uh, so this is for you. Whatever you get, you get and it's yours. So I'm just gonna add spikiness to these guys too. I'm not totally perfect. It's not because of speed or sloppiness. It's just, I don't, I don't aspire to be completely perfect. I'm just about as perfect as I can handle. Just kidding. It's not very perfect, believe me. So here we go. This reminds me of like uh, one of those scary saw blades from those terrible Halloween movies. So now I've got something that is really looking like a primitive design. And I'd say it's very weak in the border still. So maybe I'll do another uh, typical motif of a primitive design and I'll do a leaf. So I'll get ready to draw some leaves in the obvious places. And maybe I'll give them a spooky shape, a little bit of a more uh, sharp looking blady thing going on so that they're a little bit more Halloween. So, and I might add one here just for balance. It's just partly eye, right? I'm gonna come over here, do the same thing again, just trace my guys. Now, I know with my design, as with most primitive designs, I'm probably gonna use colorful, mottled, tie-dye looking patterns. And it's gonna become busy fast. Because I know it's gonna come become busy fast, I'm pretty good with the way this looks. There are other things I could do quickly to
to um, make it a bit more complete, and those things might be add a swag, right? I could add a swag like this. Could have gone the other way and done a reverse swag where it was big in the middle coming up like a widow's peak. Added a little swag there. Can decide on that later. Could do something else, like I could round out these corners and plan on them being black. But as far as the sidebars go, with, with our plants in them, I'm probably going to leave those alone because you know what they are bringing? Stability and balance. And now I've added a little bit of detail here. I've got some going on in my stripes. I can imagine that part. I've got a little bit of a swag going. There's other possibilities here. I could put faces in the flowers. Um, I could add different things, but I probably will add the rest with the colors of my wool strips or my yarn as I hook. For me, at this point, this is a fairly complete looking primitive design, and I'm real happy with it. You know, this I, I would hook this if I had the time, which I don't. Uh, this is something I do with my daughter, these exercises in folding a paper in half. Now, if you don't have tracing paper, just use a regular piece of printer paper do half of it and then and then hold it up to the window on you know a sunny day and just trace the other half you don't actually need tracing paper you just need a marker or you don't even really need a marker you could use a pencil or a pen and then just bring this to staples and tell them how big you want it never costs more than two three dollars to make something gigantic um, so something like this isn't going to be gi gigantic so this was a good example of just a really simple primitive design Quick, 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 right? So let's look at a different kind of a design. Let's do something primitive that's a little bit different. I could seriously do this all day, and sometimes I do. I like to do it in the evening when I'm having some wine and ideas are flowing and kids are busy with television or riding bikes and uh, it's not quite so miserably hot. I'm just gonna frame up my little border here again. Thinking about what we can do this time. I didn't. I didn't really think about it in advance because I know ideas usually come. And it's usually fine. Oh, I know. I know. A lot of the designs I just showed you are um, another very common uh, motif. The folding it in half here. Let's fold this one in half. Like mug designs and vase designs, right? That's a real typical primitive motif. Doing something like this. This is half of a vase I'm showing you. Maybe it comes in, then it comes back out, and then it sits on a sort of plinth thing. That doubled obviously is going to be a vase design. Can't really see through this paper as well, but I bet you're following me just the same. A candlestick vase design, right? So you can already see something like this. Flowers coming out, right? Pump, a big pumpkin coming out. All kinds of things can happen with this kind of a design. Other kinds of primitive designs, um, vase designs, mug designs that people like are like jar designs, like um, this kind of thing, like a crockery thing with an ear on it. That kind of thing is gonna work really well too. Okay. Again, some people do the little whatever stoneware design like that and then pussy willows, flowers, whatever coming out of it, something but real easy to do vessel motifs. So let's do a vessel motif, they're super easy. So I've got my grid paper behind, this is a much smaller grid. Let's decide what we wanna do this time with um, shaping it. I said we were gonna do one with heavy sidebars, let's do one with a heavy um, bottom bar. So let's do the bottom bar. I wanna keep a sidebar. So why don't we do that last, and first let's decide, we're gonna decide this later too, what's in the bottom bar. But let's fill up the center with some kind of a, a vase or vase thingy. So, all right, let's go back to the kind that I just did. I'm gonna keep it kind of short, like a candlesticky thing. And I'm gonna actually have it come down to meet the, bo the bottom border. This is what I'm doing. You can see there's a lot of possibilities there with filling it in later, graying it in, multicolored model stuff. So now that I've got that, I could do, let's stick with the wagon wheels for now, right? That was working real well. So let me start with a big wagon wheel here, right in the middle, and you see how I split it in half? Let me bring that over here again. And I'm gonna use this. Now you put your favorite flower, whatever your favorite flower is, try that one, you know, try that. 
something um, that's special for you. I put a couple of them here. I won't put the spikes on them this time. I'll keep them different. And then we could add a different thing, like who knows what these are. Little colorful bits of something, but they're there. Real simple. All right. So it certainly looks like the beginning of a primitive rug, right? So now that I have defined this space, I could really do something sort of custom with my sidebar. Um, this is my sort of anti-space, my negative space, and the, con the contour of the vase and the shape of the flowers is my positive space. So I could really go out on a limb and do something crazy like this, right, just to mirror it. And now the world is my erster. In terms of what I can do in these bars, it's pretty much infinite, right? I could just do, I could do this the whole way around, all the way to the border, and that would be super lovely. I could add something, like let's add a cat, right? Let's add a cat, like a little simple, a little crazy nose, this kind of thing, right? Let's see what his body's gonna look like. Let's have his body look like this. And you know what, let's have his tail break the border, right? That's a good idea. And maybe he just sits like this, one paw. That's pretty bad, which means for primitive rug hooking, it's pretty good. Could even give him another paw there. I'm not gonna do that though. He already looks super tubby, but I'll take him. For all intents and purposes, he's doing what he needs to do. He's a placeholder for an idea. So I like the idea of his tail breaking the border, right? And maybe you like that too. It's good to break the border. Breaking the border creates interest. Certainly doesn't mean that I cannot continue doing swirlies behind him. Probably will. I might want to do something else. I might want to add just one final thing to the corner to punch it up, right? I might want to do something in the corner like a primitive star in black, and I'm picturing that with really white star or a neon yellow star, something punchy. And then probably for the rest of this design, I'm going to do this kind of thing. And I'll leave the area around him. And you see I'm doing very irregular lines. I'm gonna do this over here too. This just gives me a guide as to how I plan to hook this. When you, if you were to do this design, you don't want to trace everyone exact, 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 because that's not what it's about. It's just the feeling of the movement. So now I've got a vase design. You know, I could do something really cute um, in a vase like this and, and put a mouse in it somewhere or turn the flowers into balls of yarn. Now that I've introduced the cat, you know, I can trace it again and do something cute, add a ball of yarn, something like that. Um, whatever, you know, it just doesn't matter. But you can keep going with your design until you feel like it's where you want it to be. Uh, sometimes a design never gets where you want it to be. I usually, I usually like it at a certain point, usually when I'm probably at a point where everyone else thinks I should have stopped a long time ago is when I, when I feel like stopping. But I like things that are busy and colorful. So this is a design that just is featuring a central uh, vessel motif Again, with primitive flowers and I've introduced an animal. Now I got a lot of choices about what to do on the bottom. I might wanna do something like 2020 big, or I might wanna add text, um, T.S. Eliot, right? Cats, the, um, what is it? Not the love song of, what is it? What is Cats based on? Oh, gosh, I almost had it. Um, tell me in the thing, I can't believe I'm blacking out on that with a master's in um, literature, but I am. So uh, yeah, text, you know, you can do cursive text, when you have your grid laid out before you, I could do something simple like in cursive, like my daughter Jocelyn loves cats, 20, 20, squiggle, squiggle, flower. And Jocelyn would love this. If I hooked it exactly like this, Jocelyn would love it words, books, and text, and all that. Um, so it becomes real personalized. 
So anything like this is possible, is doable, and you should certainly try it. It doesn't take a lot of artistic skill, it doesn't take a lot of thought. Um, let's try something else. This is another style, it's the same principle. I'm, instead of folding this, I'm, half, I'm folding it into quarters. So let me just get my borders in here. It'll be a little bit trickier. I'm not going to be overly precious about the border. Doing something in quarters um, gives you a completely different look, more of a pa paper cut look. Like sometimes I talk about that class I took last summer, it seems like so long ago, in German paper cutting. Um, but it was neat because with paper cutting, it really made you think about space and the division of space in terms of halves and quarters. So if I start with something like this, I can um, fluff it out later with the second half. Let's just stick with the two right now. If I were to do something like sort of thinking Pennsylvania Dutch and I was going to do something like this kind of a feathery leaf motif, this isn't going to be quite as pictorial. It's going to be a bit more graphic, but let's just see what we've got so far. This didn't come out exactly like a circle either, so I might build on that. I want to be sure you can see what I'm up to here. Okay, so, so far we've got this. So that's not a bad start for a rug. You, I know that you've seen rugs that look like this, right? are going to start to look like this. I'm going to add this because um, that's going to give it more of a four-leaf clover look than a circle look. And then I can think about whether I want to put acorns in. Again, would I want to add a bird, an animal? Uh, maybe I'll try adding a bird. Let's see how that works out. That's probably not going to work out already because I did it too close to the seam. But let's say I did something like this. Let's see if I can salvage that. Now, let's see. We don't want him to be joined at the butt because that has all kinds of weird connotation. But he's joined at the butt. But you know what we could do? We could maybe bring one across like this, right? And so he would be all black and bring the other one across like this. And he would be behind. And then we've got, again, still looking very Penn Dutch with the birds up there like that. I'm not loving it, but I now I've committed to it, so let's stick with it. I don't know that I would have done two sets of little feet there too, but who cares? Right. Okay, so now I've got that there. I don't know that I want it on all four sides. Um, I might want something different here. I would say like a moon or a star or whatever. Let's do like a, let's do a leaf. Let's see what happens. Designs that are in quarters are harder. That goes without being said, right? It's a weird looking leaf already. Now, this one I'm going to try on all fours. Let's see what happens. This is all about experimentation. And of course, once you get into this, if you say to yourself, well, I like that part of it, but not the rest, it doesn't have to stay in quarters, doesn't have to stay in halves, you're going to repeat your design. Actually, it's not bad. I can't say I completely hate it. Um, kind of like it with the, little, with the little leaves. So let's go back in and overdo it, because why not, right? So let's do something like this with like a couple of cherries. because the cherries would make a nice color in the thing, especially if it was like a light background. Um, you can see that we're really getting there, right? So now this is a great opportunity to look at this design. I'm gonna switch from quarters, because I'm very quarter heavy now, and I'm gonna start doing things that are in halves and ones. So I like this. I like the way this came out, kind of like the figure eight, but I don't wanna keep it going. I'm gonna make a solid um, oval in the center. and. Maybe I want to do something like this too, right? I'm just adding this by hand. It's going to work well that way. A little sort of uh, starburst out that way. I'm going to come into halvesies now. 
and I'm going to look at the design in halves and say to myself, all right, well, um, one thing I noticed with the design is it's very, um, it's very uniform, it's very flat. What if I did something with framing the corners? What if I did something like this? And I'm going to plan on that being black. And I'm going to bring it into, let's see if I can bring it into all four corners. That might unify the design, like framing it up, giving it a good, uh, very structured frame, making a real good anchor for the thing. So this is fine. It's not my favorite design. But you can go back in at this point and hand draw things. Maybe it's a good time to hand draw a single um, leaf. So like a little blank area there, right? So I have not created an insanely, um, you know, heart-stopping work of art here, but the principle is the thing. I've done, I solved my problem with the bird's tails by crossing them. I think it's actually a good solution. I like the four sort of long plumes. They remind me of kind of um, pods, you know. This is a design I could see doing the four seasons with. You know, if you did something like this and you decided to, once you had drawn your base that you're gonna have some something sticking through in each corner and the corner blocked off, you could do different things with the birds, um, four different birds, four different seasons, four different plumes, four different colors, four different styles of leaves or fruits. Um, it's a good design for that. Doing something this way, you can really create your own sort of four seasons design. But this is another way of doing things that works out real well. So let me show you, uh, before I show you some pieces I'm actually working on um, as the ending, let me show you another technique that I sometimes use. I used it in both of these. This is um, a Halloween design I did last year. I'm gonna bring it out again. It's a repeat design. And this reminds me of my Aunt Joan, who I loved very much. She was a very, very, very tough lady. Uh, professor of English for over 60 years at a university in Rhode Island, in uh, Newport. And um, super artsy, and she had something on her wall that was a repeat of a woman, watercolored, like it was, it was more, it was like 16 little watercolors, and each one was slightly different. And it was one of those things that as a child, I fixated on. I dreamt about it, I thought about it, I, I drew it, I redrew it thousands of times in the margins of my notebooks at school. And, um, and when she passed away, I, I, obviously I was not thinking about this through all these years and I would rather have her back than anything. Um, but I wish that I could have seen it again and it wasn't there and I don't know where it went. She probably got rid of it in a whimsical way like she got rid of everything in a whimsical way. But uh, I tried to recreate it last year because she had died and I tried to do it with this sort of character. It's a repeat character. And basically what I'm doing is I'm taking the idea of a bust, right? This very basic bust of a woman and I'm repeating it. I'm repeating it this many times. So each time I'm tracing it and in this case I drew it differently. Now this is one of the designs that I sell but you could do something real similar. She's like a glam character here, and a mummy, and a princess, and a vampire, and a mystic, and masquerade, and Cleopatra, and a ghost, and a pumpkin head. And, you know, it's, it was very easy to just cut out this shape even, trace around it on each one. And I did the same hair, it's something like this for each one. And sometimes I added jewelry, right, possibility. And I always had the mouth kind of something like this, but you could do something completely different. Uh, very stylized eye, don't even need a nose, but sometimes it's nice to just have a suggestion. And then, you know, you could give her this kind of stand up, heading toward an Elizabethan type collar, or button up shirt, or something with uh, lapels, or whatever. Something with big sleeves on the edges, right? You don't have to stay within the confines of your cameo. But with a repeat design like this, if you start with a shape, right, that's a really poor example you repeat it as many times as you want and do a little variation on each one and you are going to have a primitive pattern that is very hard to beat in terms of design. Very, very solid when you start with a repeat because you already have something in common and the eye is searching for the joke, which is what is the difference between each one? 
and it, it's something that most people love. I love. I love repeats. This is uh, another example of a repeat, right? This is a this is a Halloween design I'm bringing out now. Um, I don't think this is my yard. Yeah, this is my yard long. This is going to be a yard long uh, Hara laundry line. So I've got, um, I added a bunch of masks in between the sweaters, but I started with the sweater. And I started with an idea I had. I, I did a bunch of cookies the other year. I, we do a theme every Christmas in our family. And my theme, my secret theme was ugly Christmas sweaters. And I dressed everybody in the family in the ugliest um, Christmas sweaters imaginable. Like, you know, we should have we should have been arrested, kind of thing. They were so ugly, um, and I made a bunch of cookies that were ugly too with Christmas sweaters. But I'm basically starting with something like this, or in the case of a sweater, you know, with a sweater you want it to be a little come in a little bit because you want to show that it's ribbed or a little bit of ribbing on the bottom, that kind of thing. But it doesn't have to be symmetrical side to side. But if you cut that out and you draw a laundry line and you put a bunch of them on the laundry line like I did and some of them have this kind of thing going, let's go skiing, or let's not if you like comfort at all. Or um, I did the one with the pumpkin face, right? Ugly, ugly Halloween sweater. Uh, so many things that you can do with just repeating one design again and again and again. So lots of possibilities when you're doing primitive design, lots of possibilities, and you know why? Because there's no rules. And why is my camera doing this to me? I'm gonna, oh, there you are. All right, let me grab something to show you that I'm working on because I want to show you how well it works when you are hooking, sorry, it's hot, when you are hooking primitive. It's very hard to make a mistake and it's a great way to start if you like the style at all. I started hooking something this morning that I really love and I'm going to put you on pause for one second while I find my hook. Couldn't find my hook because it was incredibly attached to my magnet. I'm not usually that organized, hence total bewilderment and confusion. So this is the design I just started hooking this morning. I was just practicing it because I wanted to see, I was using a, um, a punch needle that a girl who's buying a kit from me is gonna be using. I got the same size as her out and realized that the yarn is too thick for it. So I was doing an experiment and I couldn't stop. And it's so good and I'm gonna show you how it's coming out, but I based it on this design here that I did. This is one of my half and half designs with the flower with the skull in it, and here's a witch face in half. I'm gonna really pop that with the colors. And then some other little motifs I did here. I did a little bit of grass, right? That's something we didn't do just now together. And in the corners I did two moons. I love moon and um, sun, but in this case it's two moons. And then I did a little cloud, like a little bit of cloud right here. So this is how it's coming out. I, I mean, I was just doing it in between sips of coffee this morning. I'm really enjoying it, really enjoying it. Um, I'm hooking it because it ended up being, there's the, there's the witch's face, there's the clown's face I was going to say. I ended up hooking it and it's, it's so easy to do. You can see the witch's face is coming out here. I'm probably going to lighten up the blues here. I have a bunch of my own blues that I dyed, but then I have a slightly lighter blue, that also the same that I dyed before I added black. And then I've got my antique black that I also dyed that I love. So the antique black is going to be the witch's face. And I just want to show you real quick how easy it is when you're working with a primitive design to get going and make progress, right? This is hooking with yarn, right? There's lots of videos on hooking with yarn. I've done a few vi videos on hooking with yarn. It's, it's going to be identical nearly, especially with thick yarn like this. This is bulky to hooking with um, wool strips. I have to say I like hooking with yarn more. I don't know what it is. It's just a feeling. But it goes really fast. And of course the yarn, I've, I've dyed it in such a way that it's, um, it has color mutations and variations and striations and it has interest. So I'm plodding along real fast here. I'm not gonna hook the whole thing, but I'm just showing you how easy and fun it is to hook a primitive design doesn't get much easier than that. And because I have the color changing behind it, um, this is all, this is, I, I put the lighter just along her face. And like I said, I'm gonna clean this up and lighten this up. I think I think this is a little too dark right here. But you can see that the vase is really gonna stand out from the sky. I want it to look like nighttime. And it's certainly gonna look like nighttime. So let's hold that thought. Yeah, let me get the other one out that I started the other day. My, the video with my daughter Jocelyn dyeing tons of fabric. 
She is such a little lunatic. Um, she did me so much beautiful fabric. This is actually another one of these designs. This one. Yep, lollipop, lollipop jack. So, real easy one here, right? Another sort of uh, jack-o'-lantern head with a bunch of lollipop sticking out of it. I was thinking of uh, Magdalena Briner. Uh, is that her name? I think so. And I did like a very subtle uh, vase underneath. So a little bit of different, different motifs. I had used break the border plants on the sides there and a little bit of outlining in the 2020 in the corners. So this one I just started and this one I'm doing with Jocelyn's amazing wool that she dyed for me. Like honestly, this child at six is, is just killing it. She's taking over the world. She's taking over the house at least. But she did all these beautiful colors. I mean, I'm gonna use, that's what made me wanna do the lollipop stuff because she did all these beautiful colors. So again, just a little um, preview of what we're doing here, especially if you are brand new and you have that eternal yarn versus wool strips thing. Um, primitives are so easy with wool strips as well. I mean, they're just easy. You've got a lot of bare spaces, negative spaces, and it's really easy to work with anything. What I wouldn't work with, unless you're doing the tiny scale of punch needle, not the Oxford punch needle. If you're doing tiny scale of punch needle, um, I wouldn't work with really small strips. You don't need to, and you're gonna lose that rough, naive, rugged, simple um, feel that a primitive can have, should have, does have, will have if you let it. So yeah, this, these are number eight strips. These are the really thick, ones that they call primitive. And you can see with using something like this, already colored for me, this is, this is just a super fun project to work on. And I'm loving it. So between that at breakfast, and this in the afternoon, and then the other 110 things I have to do, like go to the dentist to get fluoride and all that fun stuff, besides all those things, um, working on other stuff with you guys, and hopefully giving you some good ideas, this phone, hopefully giving you some ideas about doing some designing of your own. And I hope that you'll try it. And I hope if you do some good ones, you'll post some pictures and show, even if it's just in a notebook or it's chicken scratchings, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I know you can do it because I already know that you're a creative person and that you probably like old stuff and old designs and old pictures and old motifs and things that can be brought into rug hooking really easily and naturally. So you should give this a try. Just take out a pencil right now, even if it's on a post-it note, fold the post-it note in half. It's going to be big enough to do a little design. See how it goes. Anyway, have a good afternoon from Ribbon Candy Hooking. See you next time.